I'm Sonia Morton Firth and you're tuned in to the Sonia Morton Firth Show. Today my guest is Darren Hardy, veteran gold medalist, extreme adventurer and fundraiser. Darren served 15 years in the Royal Engineers. In 2017, he was discharged after being diagnosed with PTSD. Over the past 12 months, he's done some crazy challenges, including a charity mission spanning 1,000 kilometers to raise money to help the heroes. Darren also runs Fortitude Front, where he helps people build a bulletproof mindset. Darren, thank you so much for being a guest on my show. It's lovely to have you thank here you and welcome to my home in Richmond. Cheers, thank you. It's lovely for you to have me here. <laughs> and now you've, you've come a little way. Um, you're not, you don't live in London, do you, Darren? You live just outside. Just outside, Fleet, yes, Hampshire, so about an hour. But that's definitely not an English accent that you've no, got. I think from when I say the word R as well. <laughs> uh, from Northern Ireland. Northern yeah, Ireland. From Northern Ireland, yeah. Uh, Darren, I want to talk so much to you about your crazy challenges that you're doing. Yeah. But before we get on to that, um, there is a definite mindset behind that. And I'd like to take you back, um, take you back to, to your military days. Yeah. Um, and first of all, why you decided to join the army? Yeah, so I grew up in a little town called Antrim in uh, Northern Ireland, and it was sort of in the 80s, uh, back in the 80s, early 90s. Well, that, so, so really at the time where there was a lot of unrest in yeah. Ireland and some people, some of the viewers might not remember that time if we've got some young viewers. I certainly remember it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it must have been, what was it like growing up? <sighs> normal to me. So yeah. it's only when I come over here and I talk about it, people are like, what? That's normal? And I'm like, yeah, do you know, you didn't have men and balaclavas coming and knocking your door and making sure everything was all right as a neighborhood watch. You didn't have people parading around with pistols at the 11th and 12th of July and firing shots off in the air. No? Okay. <laughs> what do you mean you don't have petrol bombs? Yeah, <laughs> like, everyday occurrence. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and seeing things in, you know, with, with the paramilitary groups, etc. in Northern Ireland and growing up in that, for me, absolutely was normalized and, and it could have been a, a, I'll probably want to say a career choice path for me, which I chose not to. Um, go down and um, yeah, I mean, from from the interfeud between them, uh, the punishment beatings, the the shootings that, that I witnessed early on in life, you know, at age eight, for example, um, is it's just normalised for me. Wow, but to say that's normalised, that must be quite something. Do you ever look back on those points and think, well, maybe that that has something to do with your mindset today? Maybe, potentially, yeah, yeah, and, and even when I talk about it as normalised, you know, having two young daughters of my own, would I want them to grow up there? No, uh, is the answer, Do you know, so maybe it wasn't normal, and I know the world's moved on a lot with no letting kids out, run around playing, hanging around the streets as you did as a kid, but, um, you know, it's completely different, but, um, yeah, I think it's definitely, I would say definitely has a, a massive deep root impact on what I do now, um, from, from especially in the competitive level of, of stuff, you know, from winning all my sports day, best sports in the year, and especially that physical element of it. And um, I grew up without a dad until I was adopted by my dad, um, but it's at uh, 12. Oh, wow, what age were you? So you were adopted at 12? Yeah, so it was me and my mum just, and then- What um, happened to real he, to your biological So dad? I believe, <laughs> I don't really yeah. know, because um, it's hard actually to get a lot of that, so my mum's not here unfortunately anymore either. Mm. So. Um, but it's, so he, he left, I think when I was like a couple of weeks old, so I don't know, uh, I know they were married. He was also in the military. Um, yeah, but I don't know much about it really. Have you ever sort of reflected back on that and thought uh, about no, looking him up? Or no, because I heard he was, um, not a very nice guy, um, i.e. Um, a, a typical incident that um, I was told when, when, when my mum was still here, you know, he, he held a knife to her tummy and said, you know, I'll cut this big out of him and stuff, you know, and he was quite violent wow. towards her um, and, and stuff. And it probably led my mum down the path, you know, eventually to the reason why she's not here, which was alcohol, you know. And uh, so it's it's not, I probably, if I went, looked him up, I'd probably do something I regret it in yeah. essence. So I just don't, I don't want people like that in my life, you know. No, of course not, of course um, not. Yeah. But growing up without a father and, you know, um, must must have had some sort of an impact on you as well. Yeah, I, I mean, again, I'm going back to this normalised word because other yeah. people had it, 
uh, to friends, had it, a close friend, you know, and it was a very sort of culture, that's how it was, you know, either the dad was out down the pub or and the mum was got together and trying the kids play together and, um, you know, and it was just, that's how our life was. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then fortunately my mum met um, a man called Dave, um, he was, uh, I think I was about nine, ten at the time, and then he adopted me, they got married and he adopted me, uh, and coincidentally he was... Um, uh, in the Royal Engineers as well, which I went on to join. Wow, so, <laughs> so you've got your, your adopted father that you call your father, he was in uh, he was in the army, yeah. uh, your biological father who you don't know, yeah. He, yeah. you believe he was in the army, yeah. So, yeah. so you had like yeah. the, the, the blood and the people around you. I think so, yeah, and, and obviously as well, like the military, albeit we had a camp in, in Antrim time, it was 25 Engineer Ridge, which I later actually weirdly went back to serve there, um, you know, we seen military on the streets, but you never knew anyone in the military. Did you respect the military um, when you were a kid? Like before you joined in, in those days, was it um, something that... I mean, it, it was it was a game with the military in place as a kid. It was um, a riot would kick off and you would be chucking stones at them, you know. Yeah. It, it was a game, it was it was a pastime that we did. Um, it was a, you know, if we seen a police or a military wagon come past on the road, we would we put, we'd put our hoops up, pretend to do something, like beat each other up, and then when they come after you, they, we'd leg it, you know, it was a game. Um, it was always like, let's try not get caught by the military or the police, you know, and the, or peelers as we called them back then. Wow. So probably not, is the answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Until I was posted back there, and on the other side, receiving the stones and better bombs being chucked at me. <laughs> so in your, so I, I know you, you were discharged after, you, you served 15 years. Yes, so I served as a soldier, um, and then I, I coincidentally went on to commission to become an officer uh, from, from the ranks through recommendation of leadership, uh, which was quite nice. Um, and you, that, you did that in Santos? Yes, that, 2012, yeah. I commissioned, um, and, and quite nice as well through the fact that I left school with nothing. What, sorry, what does commissioned mean? So uh, you've got non-commissioned officers. Mm -hmm. So you're sort of your Lance Corporal, Corporal, Sergeant, Staff Sergeant, Sergeant Major. Uh, and then you've got your officers. Then you have the Queen's Commission. So your Lieutenant, uh, Captain right, Major. Right, so it, it is quite an honour to... Yeah, yeah very, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, a massive honour. A massive, um, yeah. Okay. Especially for these people that apply from all over the world to come to the most prestigious leadership training academy in the world. Um, unfortunately for me, I'd seen it as a boring military course <laughs> and didn't feel that, which I think is something in my game, my mindset, and it must be something we're growing up. I don't really see what I do as much achievement. Um, we'll, we'll definitely come back yeah. to that. Definitely, <laughs> yeah. is that, that I think is, yeah, is key. Yeah. Yeah. But you, you, you went on, you did that. Went on, commissions, yep, yeah. um, up to the rank of captain again. So I went through Sandhurst as a non-grad, as in no qualifications, just through on, on merit, if you want to call it, which I think is a good way, mm -hmm. I suppose. Um, but again, and, and that opened up more doors for me, especially in the educational world, you know, um, with, with I left three C's um, of GCSE level to get the job I wanted in the Royal Engineers. And, and then on May the next year, so seven months away, I've got my master's, you know, master's in business. Yeah, which is so fantastic. It's, yeah, and that's through the Sandhurst route that has definitely helped with that. So you were diagnosed with PTSD when you left? Yeah, so during my serve, during the last few years, yeah. What? What happened? Where where do you attribute the PTSD or the post traumatic mm. uh, stress? Yeah, so 2015 was a pretty shit year for me. Tell me about 2015. Um, so we're in Canada on a train next time. So I was uh, I commissioned into the Royal Army Medical Corps. So I was, uh, I was in charge of doctors, medics, etc. We set up the treatment facility in in Batis in in Canada. And then for people who don't know what that is, it's, you know, it's a train area where all our, um, our tanks, our, our artillery vehicles go out, you know, all the heavy machinery, if you want to call it, goes out and operates and does, we do live firing against each other. And, um, but it's not actual war, there's no, it's not No, war, so it'll be one battalion and another battalion and this commanding officer will basically be against this commanding officer. Okay. Imagine a big game. Okay. Um, but, um, and it's all, we all get layered up with something called TES kit, so we could, if I aimed and shot you, it would beat that you've been hit and it would tell you your injury. And then from there, then wow. the medics would go and treat you, etc. So it's a bit like paintballing then. <laughs> so yeah, 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 probably. So um, probably is an No, like it's that exactly like that, that or laser quest. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's like that, and with it, the civilians are going to pay a lot of money for, and yeah. we hate it because you have to lump all this extra kit around. Yeah. <laughs> and then even the vehicles and the tanks get fitted up with that. Um, but during the, the phase like this, so the, it's, kind of, it's, it's a prairie, it's like a big desert area of grasslands and there's one tree that everyone refers as Lone Tree, that's sort of the good reference everyone goes to. 
And during the phase of the live firing, so we actually are we're firing live weapons um, at targets and on pop out, and it's just so we can like, practice and get those it's different to firing a blank than the live. And um, some of the the tracer rounds, so the ones that you see in the in the film that will be firing, you can see the little where the bullet's going. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's a tracer. It would set the grass alight, and because it's hot, that yeah, it's like you know, 35, 40 degrees heat, um, and the grass catches quite quick. And on this particular day, it was very windy um, and, and it spread, so the, the fire was spreading quick. Um, and we had loads of them, it happens all the time, and it is probably about the fifth time of being out to Canada, so I'm quite used to it. And as everyone else knows, if you're in armoured sort of regiments, you're always out there. And you would have people that soldiers, trained soldiers that were quite, and they would beat the fire with beaters to stop it from spreading, or a couple of the vehicles, like I was a 432 commander, we would, it was an armoured tank. Um, and we would cut the grass up to stop it from spreading. So the exercise would come to stop and it wouldn't sort of get chipped in in this. But this one particular day, you know, we, the fires sort of passed us and there was um, these people like beating the fires. And um, and at this point, where uh, what were you, were you, you finished Sam to so you, were you reading? Yeah, were yeah. You, so you were... a couple of years after I finished, so I, was, I think I was a captain at the time. Yeah. So I was looking after all the, all the saying I had um, physio, dentist, doctors, combat medical technicians. Um, so you're leading? Yeah, leading yeah. so I had about 20 something guys there, yeah, and uh, we were sitting and we didn't know the fire was, was where it was and whatnot and I was sitting in my CP, it was command post, just manning the radio and and then this sort of, um, a pickup truck screeches outside and it was, there was all this commotion going on and I put my head out, someone shouting, boss, boss, quick. And we didn't know at this point, was it real? Because we were doing real life medical cover and exercise cover. So we were being tested with these, going back to the test kit, you know. Yeah. So, so we didn't know at this stage. And um, So you didn't know if this was a ho uh, part uh, of it? We thought it might have been training. training. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then very quickly realised it wasn't training. And, and unfortunately, the soldier had fallen into a fire um, and she she was um, oh. burning. Um, and uh, yeah. How did you fall into the... So from what I'm led to believe, um, so I haven't spoke to her since the incident, but um, I, I said like, I haven't spoke to her until a few weeks ago. She reached out to me because she see me on Good Morning Britain talking about this and mm -hmm. um, we're planning to meet up with her hopefully soon and, and talk her through my view of what happened mm -hmm. on that and, and what the team did to, to, to help her and stuff. Um, so I'm led to believe it ignited from behind her and she tripped, fell back into it as she'd already beat some out. Uh, but the, a, ton, a couple of people that tried to help her got their hands burnt, nothing severe. So it sort of turned into sort of a um, mass castle with more than one casualty in essence. So it had to sucked up my resources and what I was trying yeah. to command and control at this point. There was my big piece and dedicating people jobs, right? Bang, that's your job. Bang, that's your job. You, know, you talk to that patient and do not let them go unconscious, mm. etc. And, and, and this, this casualty was drifting in out of consciousness. Weirdly, when she How bad was, was she burned? Well, I don't know the exact extent, but if you can imagine the way I describe it, when she was just, we got her straight into the bed and her hands were up here. And we couldn't get an IV dripping because her veins and all were burnt up her arm. And she was wearing glasses, so this was all burnt. Her airways were burnt, so we couldn't get anything in. Um, I mean, it was touch and go, uh, really touch and go. Um, and we uh, basically, um, she used litres, I can't even remember, lots of litres of oxygen, and we had to get her out there by helicopter. But the way I sort of describe her hands is like, um, if you like blow up a, a sort of white, you no know, sort of surgical glove, that's what it sort of looked like, but it was dripping, you know? And then um, it's, it, that sort of stays with you really. Um, and uh, yeah, so while I was in, I was trying to get a helicopter in, so I stopped the whole exercise. Can you see it right days. now? If I ask you to go back and you actually picture oh, it. When I'm telling you that, I can visualize really? it. Yeah, yeah. But again, that that's not my that's not a problem for me. It's it's that sticks with me, but it's not something that concerns me now in life. That does not worry about that. So we 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 did the handover take her. We got her out of there and flew her to got her to the nearest. Um, where we like marked out the helicopter, spoke to the pilot, got in helicopter, and she took a turn for the worst on the way to the hospital. We needed to get her to. We had to redirect her and then move her by thing. I think she spent months in months in the hospital. Like they flew her parents out like, from the UK to say goodbye I think was the main reason and I that took me hard I was like god did I do everything right that I could have done could I made a quicker decision here could I made a better decision there etc and and thankfully obviously she survived and, and and it was you know the team but it hit a couple of my team members quite quite hard you know, being that brand new out of training uh, and 
And I guess it's something you're not expecting doing the training, Joe. It's not like your suit. It's not like exactly it's completely different to when you're in a wartime situation, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but I mean, you get a lot of injuries out there too. If they're a guy gets shot through both legs, you know, um, uh, by accident, so we dealt with that as well. Yeah, it was quite funny to be honest. But um, <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, he had, he had uh, a few weeks left in his 22 year career in the military. He was standing at the wrong place, wrong time, and um, and he. <laughs> It went through um, when the infantry guys in the clear building, they shot through the wooden target, through the wooden wall, and through both his legs, and we dealt with that too. And I was just like, Is he okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah, fine. Yeah. Actually, it was a bit funny. Um, <laughs> but, uh, a bit of military banter. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, but yeah, so that, that day, um, I sent all the team off. I said, look, I'll cover the rear tonight. Get your heads down and we'll relax. And I was sitting in the, in the treatment facility. It was a 12 by 12 military tent, so nothing. You nothing effectively could have saved her life. Sorry, I've just gone back on. Because your mm. actions that day. Yeah, so I had a really good insight written up by one of the soldiers of how I reacted um, of, of the communication and clear, concise comms that you know, made everything happen in, in the way it could have. And some people said that to me, did you save her life not single-handedly? Did some of my decisions potentially? Um, do I take any credit for that? No, I put it all from the team. Um, but again, that's probably who you are, how I am wired. Mm. Um, but it was, the, it was the smell of the burning flesh that... that lingered for a couple of days um, and I was just thinking about it and that's when everything was like did I do the right thing did I make the right decision and then we cracked on we finished the rest a few weeks and maybe four or five weeks out there and then we came back to the UK and I said I was a captain in the army at this point so I'm supposed to have this moral compass of you know lead the way people should aspire to be like me I should be right I started to find myself really withdrawn uh, from things from people um, I would literally get up in the morning I was living in Catrick um, based up there, but even my, my missus, she wasn't my wife at the time, was based down here, so we'd travel at weekends. Didn't uh, socialise in the mess function. Um, I used to go out of almost get into fights and stuff that shouldn't be of an, of an army officer. And was this was this just a new occurrence for you? Yeah. Since this, yeah. In, this yeah. incident? Yeah. And, and then I was starting to have dreams and flashbacks to Iraq mm. um, in 2006, nine years prior. So I. So what happened in. 2000s. So, yeah. I hope I'm not jumping the no, gun. No, no. So, um, yeah, so I went and spoke to people in the, in the ministry, yeah. reached out for help. Um, and well, that in itself, so you actually did reach out. Eventually. So it took me uh, five months, four or five months to do that, of feeling like this. And it's really, I, I like to sort of describe it as an implode um, of, of sort of rather than explode. But my temper was exploding, so I would literally. I, where I live in, in Farnham, um, a little town, posh town as well, and someone cut me up on, on the road and I, that was enough to make me snap and get out and try and literally drag this person out of the car um, when they'd done probably nothing intentionally, mm. but there was probably some underlying issue there Yeah. that that, that was just whatever was throwing me over there. Yeah. Um, I was like, I can't be like this, what's going on? I was actually at a, a kid's birthday party and I sat in the corner of my own... Um, and I felt really not wanting to it. And it was, it was um, my wife's friend who said, what was wrong with Aaron? And then it was from there, I was like, God, is there something wrong with me? So that's when I sort of reached out to help and go through it. And um, yeah, I did. And uh, they, they, so they sort of basically, and actually I linked back to an incident in Iraq where a helicopter was shot down in 2006 and we were the cleanup party. And it was the smell of the burning flesh to the smell of the, the five people that were molten in that incident which was the trigger. Because that was all over the news, wasn't it? Yeah, the helicopter. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually now remembering it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, seeing it on, you know, YTV or BBC or whatever yeah. as the big helicopter going down. Yeah. Wasn't there a famous scene in that? As well? um, there sure. was a couple of the famous, there was um, with somebody... A guy walking out burning? Yeah, falling at the tank burning. Yeah, the warrior. Yeah. So that was with... So as you can imagine, the helicopter went down it attracted a lot of attention from the locals. Mm -hmm. which caused riots, public order scenes, etc. And that was, yeah, one of the scenes from there. I actually know the guy. Um, I met him, he run, does a lot of running. I met him at the Warrior Games. Really, really nice, down to earth bloke. Um, yeah. Is he okay now? It's grand, yeah. He's, he's obviously got um, quite a bit of scarring in his face yeah. and that, but ah, oh, one of the nicest folks I've ever met. So, they, how did they link it back? Because you didn't suffer then at the time? No. When you, so, you'd been through the 2006, been through mm, that scene. Fine. And you were fine? Yeah, yeah, didn't think much of it. Um, because it was my job, I was 20 yeah. years old, maybe 19, yeah, 20. But, but afterwards was then... Yeah, and, and even at that, even that event itself in Canada, 
it's nothing to me, you know, as in it didn't, doesn't bother me, I don't think about it, don't dream about it, had a couple of words with myself afterwards about it, but it, it's everything now, so I'm talking to my, like, my, my dreams, nightmares, I'm going to call them now, that I wake up at night to, maybe once or twice a week. Um, sometimes. Still? Still, yeah. Once or twice a week, and mm. this is, what, two years mm. later since you were diagnosed? Yeah, yeah. But going back to 2006? Yeah, um, and, and what's really weird, I find that it mixes sort of fact and fiction. And I went and seen a, a friend of mine, actually, who's really good into mindset and, and psychology, and he was telling me, he put it, put it to me so clear, um, a guy called Gary Turner, who come from a, he was world championship kickboxer um, 13 times, you know, and but he's now getting into the mental stuff. Yeah. And it was more he got involved through the impact sports in the brain, but now he does all this other stuff. Um, anyway, he then put it to me so well of, if I hear a gunshot, a, a, a car or a loud bang, let's say, it will trigger something that makes me think of a gunshot immediately. Probably like most military people, you yeah, know, if yeah. they spent a lot of time in, in those areas. Um, but what he was saying, obviously that could happen to 40 degrees, 50 degrees heat out in the desert. But he says uh, if you're walking down Fleet High Street and it, you hear that backfire and it's raining, then it will automatically link some of the weather to, to the PTSD. And that's how the brain obviously puts it in then. And then other things with what your brain knows, i.e. horror movies or war movies yeah. that you've seen, it links pieces of that. But you've actually and lived the war, you've lived yeah, those horror movies, Yeah, right? I mean, something like, something completely, uh, this only happened a few weeks ago. Normally I get a dream of, um, not even so much the helicopter incident, there was another incident out there where we, the, the Iraqi police shut the road off and it was, it was a perfect ambush set up in essence. But from what happened in reality to what happens in my dream is, is completely weird. Um, so uh, I, in my dream, I, I, I take shot, I, I fire and I, I aim at a bloke and shoot him. But as he drops, um, there's like a little blonde girl behind him and I've shot her as well. And I can't get out to help her. Um, and my psychologist reckons, so I was with my, uh, an old partner who had a who had a, her own daughter and um, not mine, and when she was around eight, we split up. And um, and the psychologist reckons that's that me because I never seen her again. So where so I split up with my ex. Yeah. Um, and she had a daughter anyway. And from age three to eight years old, I almost followed that girl. Right. Okay. okay. And I never yeah. seen her again. Okay. Um, so uh, much she, she she had an affair, went off, did mm. a thing, and and took Ruby away. Mm. And uh, yeah. Uh, from there, uh, they reckon that girl that I've shot in my dream is, is that. I never see the face, which is really strange. Um, I, but I can never get out of the vehicle to go and help. So it's, it's something holding me back in, um, which is weird. And this is a recurring dream? This is the That dream. happens quite a lot, yeah. I had a new one in essence, which has nothing to do with anything. Um, a mate of mine um, who, who died years ago and uh, military. Um, he, uh, I woke up, I was in my room, or I don't know, so I was still dreaming, and where I'm lying, the, the sort of bedroom door was there, and uh, I had this sort of half a corpse of a body crawling round into my scent, Daz, Daz, help me, mate, help me. And, and it's your friend. And, and it's my friend, and, and I couldn't, um, I, I can't, I don't want to get out of my bed, help me. Scares the shit out of me, really. But my only sort of by seeing us, I still see a psychologist and stuff with my PTSD mm. and everything. But um, the only thing I can sort of think of that is is like the the half a body that we recovered in 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 the scene from from the helicopter that went down because we never really we didn't cover like full bodies. It was parts of bodies. So it's only sort of link I can make up myself. And so so they've diagnosed you at this point with PTSD. Yes, yeah, so this is by P two thousand fifteen. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and then, did you have further low points after that, um, or did they uh, were they continuing to help you? Um, yeah, so they, they did continue to help. So I, I right up until I like, discharged in two thousand seventeen, um, and then six months after that, and then they passed over to Tills, or I went through Help for Heroes. Um, but I mean, more and more in two thousand and fifteen, I thought I was getting maybe a little bit better. Um, and I, I was training for special forces at the time, um, and I was up in like doing my my time down in um, in Hereford or Pool. I was down there for weeks and time, or up in Brecon, and we'd done a prep course, which is basically the sort of the, the last sort of selection point before actually going on SF selection. 
and I was coming back. It was a weekend off. I was coming back from London um, on the, I mean, the 5th of December, 2015. And then I was like, uh, phone ringing, phone ringing. I was like, okay, what's this? See three or four missed calls. I picked it up and I was like, uh, Darren, your, your mum's gone. I was like, ah, oh, dear. Um, so that hit me. I was on a loaded train coming out of London oh my with my God. wife at the time. Wife at the time, um, who wasn't my fiance at the time, she was. Um, because we get married, we get married two weeks after that. Um, which we still went on did. Um, but it was, yeah, it was quite... The annoying thing for me, I fell out with my mum. She had a drink problem, which split her and my dad up years before. Yeah. A few, um, uh, my dad who adopted me split her mm. and up. Um, and it sort of her drinking problems, you know, sort of tore bits of the family apart with that, um, which was sad. And the annoying thing for me, my last conversation with my mum was an argument telling her she was uninvited to my wedding because I didn't want her for responsibility. Right. Just, so. just, just my instant thing is, um, you did nothing wrong. Have you actually gone back no, and forgiven no. yourself for, yeah. or not forgiven yeah. yourself I mean, and I've, let that go? I've got that yeah. and I've tried to, yeah. It's just annoying um, because she was just dead excited, obviously, you know, to come and... So when I went back, I think one of the hardest things that hit me, so because her and my dad weren't no longer together, I was next to Kings and the eldest son. And uh, yeah, it was just having the organised funeral that a few days before getting married, a few days before getting on the toughest, most renowned course in the world of <laughs> SF selection. And uh, yeah, just carried on, did it all. And the, probably one of the biggest things that hits me is the dress that my mum bought for the wedding was all hanging up with the with the um, the price tag on it so we actually buried her in that because I thought that might have been a good thing for it. she would have wanted so she was in 51 oh um, god I know so she was drinking and fell and hit her head and died. oh my god that's mm. yeah. so young and it was my uncle who's her brother who went around the next day and found her lying in the hallway unfortunately so yeah so it's one of those things and uh, you buried her on the Tuesday and then got married on the 21st of uh December and then started SF selection in the third. So what happened with the SF selection? Went on it, cracked on, felt great, um, and then uh, I just it must have hit me on it. You're writing Breck and Beat and Black Mountains on your own mm. all day, so I think it was um, yeah. I was in and on my own, and poof, just everything hit me. Um, this roller coaster motions, and I went and seen the medic, and they sent me straight to the psychologist, and they did took me off course um, straight away, and then from there I just had this roller coaster 2016 of loads of surgeries I had on my shoulder. I've had seven ops um, on it from another previous injury in the military, um, injuries, and um, wasn't just one. Um, and then straight that last sort of year to going through the medical discharge process to, to through being discharged with PTSD and a sh shoulder injury. So this has been partially replaced and they can lift it to here and um, yeah. So. And and do you do you think you did you reach rock bottom on Brecon Beacon? Was that the point? Or I don't you... think it was rock bottom because in two thousand and eighteen, when I thought about taking my life, was rock bottom. So hang on. So you've already <laughs> been discharged. You've been discharged from the army. Yeah, two thousand and seventeen. Presumably you were still seeking counsel, or you had some sort of counselling. Still the same. Yeah. So under the military care for six months after. So up until March eighteen. Can I just on that? How long did the military have? Uh, or how long were you under military care after you were just discharged? So through physical, it's three months. Uh, so physical, physio and stuff, and then mental is six months. Six months. Which, to be honest, I think something would have got wrong. Uh, it's completely my, wrong. Yeah, That's so nothing six months. The, my last session, I remember, mean, was yesterday. He's like, oh, this is our last session today. I'm like, what? And that's it, you just left to go mm, out they, into the they, big wide they world. They transfer you over to Tills, which is the NHS version, but that's again, mm. that was rubbish to be yeah. honest. Um, I think they've got better now. Um, yeah, and uh, that's when I reached out to Help for Heroes, which is, uh, I truly say, without their hidden wounds team, which is all psychology stuff, is I wouldn't be here. So, mm. that point at 2018, what, what happened? So we had um, we had uh, Georgia. I on uh, my eldest was three, come four in February, um, and and I so we yeah got married and decided so obviously to have a kid, and um, it was great. Well, I say it was great. I struggled to bond at this point. I I was really like I still now I'm quite emotionless now, um, in a way I think something's gone somewhere in the emotion side of stuff. Um, you know, for example, is you walk down the street and someone drops dead, they'll be like, yeah, all right, cool. You know, that's where I'm at in, in my emotions yeah. of it. Or if someone I knew, even know that it's passed away, it's just like, what is what it is. I think since 
having a couple of friends being killed and lost or taking their life and then my mum and it's just like okay what's you know it's just another thing that's happened in life you know we we can't choose what happens but we can choose how to react to it you yeah, know of course, yeah. and and that's where i'm at now in, in this whole mindset piece of choosing how to react and so yeah so i struggled with one my daughter um everything was going pretty crap to be honest um and then we uh she, she was born where are we now 2017 um yeah, and then and then Gemma, my wife was pregnant again with Jessica, the second baby, mm. which we thought might have made things a bit better, but it probably made things a lot worse. And and then it was weird because I was going to all these dad meetings afterwards, you know, and everyone was like, "Oh, it's amazing!" And I'm like, God, "This is rubbish. What have I done?" You know. Yeah. And uh, and I thought to myself, but it's just pretty crap because society yeah. is busy saying, "Oh, you should be feeling amazing on top of the world," and it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. But actually, that's that's a load of horseshit as well because you feel yeah. what you feel. No one can tell you how you exactly. feel. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it is. It's you know, these got these little people that come to life and just suck up every piece of resource mm. you've got, and time and energy, and cry, and you know, you're like, oh, "What am I supposed to do here?" And you know, everything's just rubbish. I was in Civvy Street, not enjoying life and job. You know, I was like, "This is crap." I felt a whole sense of belonging gone. Because um, you left the arm. Yeah, yeah, and and then I like I was like, okay, well, I'm just gonna sack this in in essence, pull the pin in life, as I say, and um, I'd sort of planned in my head to book a flight out to the Middle East and go and be a mercenary and just fight until I die in essence, um, and that because I I missed that. That's one thing I miss is adrenaline rush of it in a war situation, and you know it's that piece that I wanted to do before leaving. And then what was my thing was like, you know, if uh, I didn't have a dad at that age, um, I can't have my kids with no dad and I've got to get a grip myself. And uh, I read a book uh, called... So actually, oh. I'm sorry, because no. that is really, that's just essential in my... So the fact that you, and I don't know if you realise this, the fact that you didn't have a dad growing mm. up, although you might have thought that it didn't benefit you, it actually did benefit you, because at that yeah. juncture, yeah. you were about to take your own life, it saved mm. you. Yeah, absolutely, probably, yeah, 100%. And, you know, the, was it as a, we're made in the first seven years of our life. You know, what sort of... Um, I think it's, I think as well, it's quite a cowardly act. I know when the people are in that position, and it's just my own view and that, and, you know, but... And, and a, selfish act, a selfish act, you know, I could have gone that, and you know, what sort of a father would I have been to take my own life and leave my kids with no dad? Mm. Or, or my, my wife is going through that struggle. You know, that's where I see the selfish piece come in, and... I think if you can, uh, my uncle said this to me, and who's a minister, if you find my mum, you know, if you could see um, the damage you create in everyone else's life after you've gone, would you do it? You know, is, is, is the question. And, but, and then that still doesn't, you, you know, I, I guess there's an argument both ways, because if yeah. you're suffering, you're suffering. And if you're actually yeah. suffering to that extent, and yeah. even contemplating your mm -hmm. own life, Mm -hmm. and, and and there are a lot of veterans. I don't know the status. In fact, I'm trying to find the statistics out, um, but I believe you looked into it as well on how many veterans yeah, did Yeah, so I think 2018, it was 71, I think, was the stat. Um, I don't know about like, last year. Yeah, but 71. And is there, and there's no one, and, and because, of, as I understand it, and, and you've just sort of said it, is that mm -hmm. post-traumatic stress doesn't happen just after the event. No. It can happen years later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So actually what we're doing is veterans or people that are serving for us are leaving the army and then they're suffering years later, potentially. 100%. And, and, and then not having any help or guidance. Yeah, and I remember reading something not so long ago, well, two years ago, about the... Um, we, they don't think they're going to have enough mental health capability to cope with the Afghanistan PTSD in yeah. years to come. Uh, and I've interviewed a few few, um, yeah. few guys that yeah. have uh, served in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. What do you think, if, if someone's watching this now, mm. um, a veteran, or oh, actually not, not even a veteran, someone mm. that's, that, that is on the verge of contemplating taking their own life, mm. what, would you give them any advice? Is there something that you yeah, could say do to them? <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 don't do it, don't yeah. do it. Um, yeah, I think that sort of advice, as we said a minute ago, if you could sort of look in to realise what sort of, um, do you know, what, what train wreck you'll leave in everyone else's life around you, your loved ones, and really think about them rather than yourself. And, and there's always a way out, I believe, now, because I always say that because I did it, you know, and uh, I had to dig deep and, and create this new lifestyle, which, which I've done, and you know, which we'll probably come on to in a bit about how I roll life at the minute. 
um, and there's always something there to do. Um, so I think it's there, there's always another answer. I'll, I'll reach out to me and I'll tell you. Well, there you it go. Is, you yeah, know, I, and we've got other, yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's definitely. there's other avenues, and I have. And help the heroes helped you, and yeah, yeah. I mean, even that, some guys have reached out to me, and I've put them in contact with the right people yeah. who help heroes who help me. So it's that did that, you know, and I think as well. You know, we talk about it in the UK of very some of it thinks might be pink and fluffy if it makes sort of. We always worry about what we say now in case someone's offended, isn't it? But in the military, you know, it's, you've got to say it how it is. And that's what I say to some people, you know. So some people text me now, so I get a lot of texts of people saying, oh, I'd just love to have the drive and motivation you have. And I'm like, well, do it. No, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to say, oh, yes, of course you can. Like, just do it. Um, or, or and tell someone you're going to do it. So was that why you set up, or was that what was behind setting up for Shoe Fund? Yeah, I thought that nothing, nothing, there's, there could be more done about this, and I think by me sharing my story might be that answer. Mm. Yeah, and I always say if I'm talking to a hundred people and I it clicks with one person, that's a little goal for me, you know. And especially they come out and I do a lot of talks in the uh, kids' schools and that as well, because you know, and, and some of the feedback I get is phenomenal. So I love it. Um, so yeah, so set that up through and the, the whole name, no fortitude, no by the pain and adversity and, and in the front bit, lead by that. So turn your negative into your biggest positive. Wow. I mean, that is, that's yeah. it. Yeah. And, and, and you did basically. Absolutely. And, and everyone can do it. And, and it's what we call, I think in the world, post-traumatic growth. Yeah. And you as an individual prior to hire, regardless how you're feeling, you're still feeling, or you're still worth a hundred percent saying to someone or anyone. And the way I just quickly put it is, uh, is a, a very easy way. You've got a 10 pound note, you scrumple it up, that's you starting to go downhill, open it back up, you can still spend it at 10 pounds. Scrumple it more and stand on it, get it dirty, that's you getting low, getting low, but it's still 10 pounds. When you think you're rock bottom, I've ripped the 10 pound note in half, I've chucked it away, but I actually have decided, okay, I want to sort this out. I pick the 10 pound note back up and I sell it to it back to the other, and I can go and spend that still as 10 pounds and that, that's you still so regardless how broken you think you are, and that post-traumatic growth piece, the bond now on that ten pound note, even though it's through some sellotape, is stronger than what was there before because I can't rip that again, and that's what I like to. I love it. That yeah. is amazing. I like the fact that you can't rip it again. Yeah, would you? Well, you've yeah. already gone rock. Yeah. They say you hit rock bottom, and then the only way, obviously, is up. Mm -hmm. Also, like scar tissue, you go into my shoulder. The scar tissue is now stronger, and the cut back through it's harder than what it was. It's the exact same as the, the ripping the note. But you're still worth that ten pounds, you know. Do you think you've discovered your purpose? Because we talked about purpose earlier. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think so. I was actually uh, I was uh, being interviewed in the Isle of Wight actually, and uh, I said I think I would like PTSD. Now, even though I still struggle with it, I believe I can manage it well. But I was saying it's one of the better things that's happened to me because I think I'm starting to make an impact on other people's lives. I think once you see the benefit in something that's gone wrong, I, I mean, I took it back to your, to your dad leaving the yeah. movie and, mm -hmm. and the doctors, mm -hmm. um, which is a lot for a lot. If you can mm -hmm. look back and go, well, actually, that was a benefit. Yeah. But to actually say you think that yeah. PTSD is a benefit is amazing. Yeah. and Because it has actually changed your life. A hundred percent. And and once you, uh, I said it earlier, but once you find this, your purpose, then then you death's not a worry. So you'll go out and you'll put yourself out there. That's what I do in these challenges. So we've got to talk yeah. about this because you do put yourself out there. And when yeah. you say death's not a worry, because I want to we'll definitely come back yeah, to that one, yeah. it really isn't a worry, is it, for you? No. So, so tell buzz. me a little bit about these challenges because over the past 12 months, you've done some, some crazy shit. Yeah. Uh, and you're just about to embark on a new one. But yeah. before we get on to that, yeah. tell me about the stuff that you've done in, in sort of over the last 12 months, yeah. particularly over in, in lockdown. <laughs> Okay, yeah. So I wanted to, to sort of prove to myself and, and inspire others that you can change your life into whatever direction you want. I can be good on this path one day and people might think my path is that's my chosen path in life, but actually I'm going to mix up whatever that, whatever someone else thinks that is and I'm going to change and go this direction and I'm going to cut my own path in life is what I'm basically doing in the minute. So I was a sprint, sprinter. Yeah, and you'd won a gold medal at that. Yeah, two yeah. gold medals, a couple of records in Colorado, um, one in 200 meter sprints. Um, but again, we, we talked about it very start, you know, I don't see that much of achievement. Probably should. Why, why do you not see that? I don't know, we always think I can do better. You know, yeah, if I'm running an 11 second dead 100 meters, for example, or 10 something, I'm like, well, why wasn't it 0.1 better? 
you know, and I'll, I'll beat myself up about that point one second. And it'll never be point one because 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 if it, if you had that, you'd want to point one second yeah, better uh, again absolutely. and again. Yeah, absolutely. And I also think as well, I just want to keep keep raising that bar. You know, you know, it's you die by perfectionism though. Yeah. <laughs> and I <I'm> say that because <laughs> yeah. I'm a bit of a perfectionist, not not in the same extent, not mm. well, not with the same thing, mm. but yeah, it's absolutely right. So. Yeah, so I went from that sprint, um, Army 7s rugby, so all fast twitch muscle fibers. I mm. thought, all right, I need to change my life. And I mentioned there about reading a book I read, David Goggins, It Can't Hurt Me. Um, and I've loved Natalie. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And I'd like I, to get him on the show. Yeah. I will do one day. <laughs> yeah, and I thought, right, like, I'm going to be a UK version of him. Uh, and that's what Oh, an Irish so version of the UK. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, European, whatever yeah, it may yeah. be. And um, yeah, so, so I Googled, landed in bed one night, I Googled. World's toughest event, Yukon Arctic Ultra came up. I was like, fine, you can do a marathon in it there, minus 50, you can do 100 miles, you can do 300, and I was like, fine, 300 miles, let's go. Um, don't know how I'm going to do it, never done that before in my life. Just tell me, the Yukon, so it's super cold, right? When I say yeah. super cold, what, 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 minus 50. Yeah. Minus 50. Yeah. yeah. So when I was out there and going along, and I've got a quick hallucination story as well in a minute, but it's that cold, um, I have to keep taking my outer layer of my gloves off, so it's just my under layer of gloves. And um, the very first night, I think it was minus 47, and, and defrosting my eyelids, because they kept sticking together every now and then. Because um, the first night, most people get their heads down, but I carried on, and as did a few others, uh, with, with a great guy I met called Chad, some Canadian bloke, and we, we just kicked off well, and we went. But there's elements of the time we weren't with each other, didn't see anyone out in the middle, you can head torch, you see all the foxes, or not the, the wolves, the moose and all around, you think, oh, this is, this is adrenaline. I, one of these could attack me right now, and I, I'm, I'm ready, you know. Not really, I was tired, and it would have killed me an instant, but yeah. um, this, I was, I was living it, living this absolute dream out there. Um, to the point of hallucination, and I was, I was walking along, and I looked up, and I, and I seen a manatee, uh, you know, a sea life animal? Yeah. And I was like, what, just in the... On, on the... on the side of the track, and I was like, oh my God, what's a manatee doing out here? This shouldn't be out here, how's it got here? And I was walking up to it and I was like thinking, right, how am I going to get it back to the sea? I'm nowhere near the sea. You know, it's frozen, it's mild deep and all this stuff. And I, I was going up and uh, I was like, okay, uh, are you all right, mate? Talking to it, crouching down, going to, to go and try and help it, thinking how I can make a stretcher, put it on my pulp, drag it, whatever. And it was, as I was coming closer, do you want me to talk to the dog? It does this sort of thing where it turns ahead. It did this. And then as I got really close, it was just a log with a bit of snow on it. And I was like, oh my God. Which then makes quest question because I've seen a mouse as well later on. I was like, did I see a mouse? Because uh, I linked that mouse to the gruffalo that my kids watch every day. And I was like, that's the little mouse in the gruffalo. And I was like, heads off with it. <laughs> but yeah, I thought I'd seen a manatee um, and I was trying to help it. And it was well, just, it's probably the oxygen or lack of oxygen or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 complete fatigue. Um, so that, that was the, the one event. Uh, and I just got a buzz for like doing these crazy events, you know, and loving it. and. Uh, I did a few other 24-hour fitness events, you know, around the clock for 24 hours, doing as many press-ups as I can, sit-ups and mile-and-a-half runs, which is a military test. And, and you uh, just jogged on a treadmill in the dark? Yeah, like so it was VE Day, yeah, 75th anniversary VE Day. I did 75 miles with 35 pounds in my back and in the 12 12 military tent in darkness. That, to date, is the hardest thing I've done mentally. Wow. Now yeah. tell me about that. Why, me like, because you've done other things that sound worse. Yeah. Like the paddle boarding, yeah. the mm -hmm. cycling, mm -hmm. and then chucking a marathon on it. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. sounds pretty bad. Yeah. But the, the, the running on it, because I don't mind running like when I used to run, treadmill never bothered me. Yeah. Although the dark bit, might. Yeah, I don't yeah, think I it was even the dark. My body was just shutting down so about 51 miles i struggled big time um and uh, this is the the pathfinder published this piece in their magazine and i was um just body was just starting to shut down i was i couldn't even do 800 meters without getting off and run to the toilets you know it was just like i couldn't take on the fluids but then i was constantly pissing it out and and then i was shaking and then um it was like two o'clock in the morning i was where the toilet was was in the next building so i had to go outside and it was freezing i sat down the curb and started to really Shake. shake and like what's going on like feeling dizzy feeling really bad was there some, did you have medical or so I, I had a guy on support with me and he was sleeping at the time i didn't want to bother him and wake him up so which i didn't in the end and uh, i just left him to it and he he got annoyed at me for not telling him eventually <laughs> so um anyway and, and yeah so i thought to myself it was raising for great ormond street hospital mm. and my kids made me this little poster saying go daddy and their handprints on it you know we love you 
I thought, okay, my kids, I need to get a grip myself. And then I thought, why am I doing this? I'm doing it for children in Great Ormond Street Hospital. Some of these kids can't even walk, and there's me moaning about me not even putting one foot in front of the other. All right, down, getting an absolute grip myself. And then that next nine miles was horrendous, grueling. And then, and then something clicked. And then the last 15 miles, I actually did 76 miles, because in the military we say, Oh, one press up for the Queen. Go on, I thought I'll do one mile for the Queen. Um, and I did like a nine minute mile on, with the backpack on for oh the 76th mile, which was fantastic. Um, just flat out, just went for it. And uh, yeah, so from that, those from mile like 60 to 76 was amazing. Last six miles that my camera guy came in, he was doing photos and that, so just seeing someone else with a bit of morale perk up. And I was like, yeah, this is, this is, I'm off, I'm where, yeah. It's very different to being on a race, obviously the crowd, well, the crowd, you know, mm. carries you when, you when you're doing marathons or half marathons yeah. or whatever, but. And all of these events I do it solo. It's um, um, so people, some people come and join it. And the, like the one I did just after that was I did 52 mile tab, swam across the Solent with my kit in the berg and pushing it across and then ran 70 miles around the other way. Um, yeah, that was just made up again. So, I mean, this is, this is craziness, but what, you know, you talked a little bit about the mindset, you thought about your children, and mm. that sort of got you through that really tough point. Um, but there must be more, because, you know, other people have got kids out there, other people can just think of, yeah. what, what is the mindset that says, I'm just going to absolutely beast myself, and, and just, I sort of throw this in, is it linked to your PTSD? Potentially. So this next one I'm working, hopefully, with a couple of guys from Oxford Brooks University um, about me and my hair. What, why, why do I not stop when other people want yeah. to stop? And as David Goggins was saying, a 40% mindset. I do believe that. And some people say, you know, your, um, your, your mind controls your body. I want my body to control my mind. I, I believe your body will keep going further. It's the mind that says stop. But just keep pushing. I mean, I, I completely believe yeah. that yeah, your mind yeah. is the the one that is yeah. controlling you. Um, but I want to I want to try and change that somehow. I don't know why. <laughs> um, only for someone that's what people are saying. I'm like, well, I'll prove it wrong. Um, and then that's what led me on. And I don't even think about these things. I just well, I do. I, I don't think in detail. I work out. So the last one, the 780 mile cycle, back carry cycle, and that didn't even have a bike. I've never been on a bike really. I was like, just pick up a bike. This next one, 10 Ironman distance triathlon. Okay, tell me about this. <laughs> this is crazy. It's called 10 by 10 by 10. Yeah. Why is it called 10 by 10 uh, by 10? So 10 Ironman distance triathlons. Uh, so 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, and then uh, a marathon. Every day for 10 days. 10 so it's just this days. repeat that bus every single day. So that's not yeah. just you doing an Ironman, which is tough enough. Yeah. You're doing 10 Ironman yeah. individually, not not all the swimming, all the running, all the... Yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing like, full Ironman distance triathlon, then the next day, doing it, I'm doing it, doing it for 10 consecutive days in 10 locations, which hasn't been done. So this is where, uh, and, and the last one being inside the London Eye. Oh, what? How can you run inside the London Eye? So they're going to link a treadmill, treadmill. up and I'm putting my turbo in there and they're going to swim in the nearby hotel. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that'll be, that'll be tough. That'd be yeah, it's the last right. one. That's the one where so ITV. What a view! I know, you know, as you're jogging along and you put ITV there. Yeah, the it's Good Morning Britain. Britain. Going to cover that again. Um, a couple of big sponsors like Ribble um, and stuff. Uh, Solomon, they're all picking it up on there in some endurance magazines. Who are you doing it for? Are you do, are for you Help the Heroes. Help the Heroes. Yes. Brilliant. It's yeah. fantastic. So, awesome. Yeah, and, and and that conversation came around. Never done a triathlon before in my life. You know. Um, I'm only sort of now still learning to swim and it's in three and a half weeks and um, I did a, I did a full distance last Sunday for a training session which is all right and it's the first one so I thought and the conversation I had with myself was driving to deliver a talk to one of my old um, regiments and uh, it was like an inspirational talk and I said to myself can I do an Ironman yes should I do 10 yes and that was like just all my thought process didn't have a proper bike so the one I did the 700 UK was borrowed from but now I've had a sponsor, so I'm ready to go properly this time because it was hard. Do you on. never have a little uh, thing inside you saying, you can't do that, don't be silly? No, so I talk a bit about um, v, um, VME, so visualise, mindset, execute. So tell, tell me about, I'm a, I'm a big visualisation yeah. person. I mean, I'm sitting in a flat that I visualised um, over a year ago and I went back on my diary and I looked and went, Riverside View in yeah. Richmond, that's what I want. And mm -hmm. it just literally, and I remember yeah. visualising it, seeing it and yeah. bang, bang, I'm here. Yeah. But how, how does visualisation, because they do say in sport as well, oh, yeah. massively sprinters. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we used to do a lot on a track and this is where I probably come from. 
Steve Barkley, he chucked a silver medalist and he didn't chuck a javelin 10 months before the event. He visualized every training session through the shoulder injury and then went on and chucked a silver medal distance. So it's huge, it's massive. So I can visualize now, uh, my, I'm not even thinking about the nine previous, the 10th one being in the London Eye, loads of crowds there, uh, media and, and then being finished and then my sort of trademark is getting a pint of Guinness afterwards. Um, and you can see it, can you feel it? I can taste the well. Guinness. And yeah. you can taste mm-hmm. it. Yeah, I can taste that cold Guinness just getting down my head. Um, and, and that's what they say, it's, it's, it's the visualisation, but it's the feeling, it's the smell, yeah. the taste, yeah. everything yeah. about... And, and, and that's exactly it, and if you can do that, it's now, I'm, I've now planned my next two events. Oh right, right. okay, so what's but, the future? Well, they are secrets, yeah, they're, they're secrets, secrets. yes, yeah, <laughs> we can't go on the same much right now. Is the book a secret? Oh, no, I've let the cat out. No, right. oh, no, no, it's not, it's not. So, and all these are going to be in the book. The mindset is going to be in the back. So I've been interviewed on all this stuff and they're like, why do you do it? And all these ones are the, the interviews of the mindset. So people see me do it and they're like, oh, yeah, you're a machine. But actually it's tough work when I'm doing it. You know, it's, it's hard. Of that course it is. And you, you can't take that away from you. It absolutely must mm. be horrendously hard. Physically, mm. obviously, massively. And but this, but is it. this is, it's got to be it's, it's that it's self-discipline. The people don't see me, well I do, because I post about it getting up at half three in, in the morning and going to the gym and then, you know, I've done three or four hours training before most people are out of bed um, and then and then I train in the evenings again. So, you know. I've just had a quick question, why do you do it? What springs I think it's my management for the PTSD. If I don't do that one day, for whatever reason, my wife notices a different in me. And um, and I, I truly believe someone like myself, PTSD, it's my loved ones affected, not me as much. Um, so it, I, I do it for all that reason. Do you feel more worthy when you do it? Do you feel more love for yourself when you do it? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Self worth. Yeah, um, yeah, self yeah, yeah. love, self self care. You know, look good, feel good. It, yeah. It's all that, and and knowing just the benefits of the 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 chemicals that training releases in the body, the endorphins, etc., versus some bottle of the counter is, is better than anything, is my belief. Wow. Darren, where can people find out about you and if they want to donate? Yes. For this next challenge, the 10 by 10 by 10. Yeah, <laughs> where absolutely. do they do that? And we'll put the link as well. Yeah, so Instagram, post every day. So it's uh, Darren, Darren Hardy 4. Um, on it, um, and the just given is just given forward slash uh, Darren Dash Hardy number seven. Fantastic, and that's for Help for Heroes. Help for Heroes, yes. So. Brilliant, an absolutely amazing yeah. cause. Perfect. Darren, we've come to the end of the interview, and I have yeah. got one last question which I ask all my guests, <laughs> and that is if you were to write a message in a bottle mm-hmm. for future generations to find. Mm-hmm. What would that message be? Oof, Sonia, bloody hell. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, that would be a great one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, probably, I would say, uh, cut every piece of negativity out of your life and focus on what you want. That's fantastic. Darren, thank, thank you me. so much mm-hmm. for being a guest on my show. Thank You're you. phenomenal. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Hope you enjoyed the show. Remember, there's a new interview out every Monday, so hit subscribe and like and you'll get it straight into your inbox.